Thank you very much for inviting me to come here to the, the symposium. I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to be here. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing the tapestry at the cloisters. So I've put up a slide of the tapestry, Christ is born as man's redeemer, just to remind ourselves really that this is the reason why we're all here. This is to celebrate the completion of the conservation of this absolutely magnificent tapestry. And the conservation that has been carried out on it looks absolutely stunning. And we're here to explore a bit more broadly the subject of the conservation of woven tapestry. And I think everybody here will agree that it's, it's one of the, the most amazing art forms. So I'm going to talk today about conservation of tapestries in a, in a broad sense. Uh, so I'm going to start by looking at what we mean by a tapestry. And then I'm going to look at the, the range of techniques that are used to conserve tapestries. And I'm not really going to look at the whole range of techniques that are used. I'm only going to touch briefly on cleaning, for example. But I'm really going to be talking about those techniques that are used both to stabilize the structure of tapestries and also to help redefine the image of tapestries. And then I'm going to finish by looking at some more recent developments and some recent research which has already begun to have an effect on tapestry conservation and which I'm sure will continue to do so in the future. I should explain a little bit about the Textile Conservation Centre just so that you know where I'm coming from. As Tina mentioned, I've been working there for the last eight years. And the Textile Conservation Centre in the UK was a centre with three main activities, and that was the, the teaching of textile conservation and also latterly museum studies and research into textile conservation, and also conservation practice. And as Tina also mentioned, the Textile Conservation Centre was closed by the University of Southampton at the end of October. And if anybody's interested, I've just got, have brought some cards which give details of the TCC's website. And this is really intended partly as a way of contacting people, partly as, as a legacy of the TCC's activities. And there are some of these cards that you can pick up, I think, at the back of the auditorium. I also just wanted to explain that the images that I'm using this afternoon are from a variety of sources. I'm very grateful to some of my colleagues for giving me some images to use in my presentation this afternoon, and it will be obvious which ones those are. And the remainder <coughs> are either of tapestries that were treated and conserved at the Textile Conservation Centre, or else their images from the book, Tapestry Conservation, Principles and Practice. So just a little bit of broad introduction, really. The symposium is primarily about the conservation of woven tapestry hangings. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And tapestries like this one fall into the category of decorative arts. They were originally intended to provide decoration and warmth in drafty, drafty castles in the medieval period. But I would say that the finest examples of tapestry weaving are indisputably in the realm of fine arts. And I think that the absolutely magnificent collection of tapestries here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art demonstrates that very well. Uh, this is a 16th century example. It dates from around 1525. It was made in Brussels. And the Low Countries, Flanders, were very much the home of tapestry weaving. It's a Western European art form. And this tapestry is like the one, that the, uh, the pictures that Tina was showing us this morning and that Lizzie was showing us this morning. It's very typical of the 16th century tapestries with a lot of, a lot of action, very dense uh, details of, of, of uh, figures, the story going on across the whole field of the tapestry. And a really important feature of these early tapestries are the dark brown outlines that are used to delineate the different areas of the design. And those often are damaged when the, the dark brown wool that is usually used in the, the weft has a tendency to deteriorate and to drop out as a result either of an acidic dye or an iron mordant being used and that can have a really detrimental effect on the overall image. 
And I just put up this one really, just to, because I, I really like this tapestry. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. But I think, again, as people were saying this morning, you know, when you look at the, the faces of these tapestries, these are real people. The, the skills of the weavers are, are very evident. This is a, a later tapestry, an 18th century French tapestry from Beauvais. And this comes from a series, the, the King of China series. A later tapestry, more like a picture, really, in style, and a lot of silk being used sorry, up in the, the sky and to provide all the highlights of the design. <laughs> and this technique is still being used today to make large-scale tapestry hangings. And this is an example that was commissioned for the cruise liner Queen Mary II. And it's designed by the Dutch artist Barbara Brookman. And it's actually a picture of the Queen Mary II coming into New York Harbour. So I thought it would be an appropriate picture to show today. And this tapestry is absolutely enormous. And this is, this is me here. <laughs> so the whole tapestry is about six and a half metres, or I suppose that's in excess of 20 feet tall. Now, uh, Tina has already touched on this this morning, but I don't think it hurts to repeat just a little bit of what we're actually talking about when we're talking about woven tapestry. And tapestry is a fabric that's woven on a loom. There are two main types of tapestry looms, again, as, as Tina said this morning. There are either the type of loom which has the warps running horizontally, which is called the low warp loom, or this type, which is high warp loom, which has the warps running vertically. So warps going up and down. And I think you can see here that the weft thread is not going straight backwards and forwards from one salvage to the other. It's being built up section by section. And this shows you the same technique being used today. This is a high warp loom in operation at the West Dean Tapestry Studio. And West Dean is one of only two commercial tapestry weaving studios now going in the UK. There's one in Scotland as well. So they're using exactly the same technique, building up color. Well, this one is not really a question of building up color because it's, it's all much of a muchness in terms of color, but it's been, you can see how different yarns are being used here to build up the design. And this is just a diagram which shows how different colors are inserted into the warp. And then all of these weft threads are beaten down to cover the warps completely and to, to make a, a weft-faced fabric. So what this means, really, in terms of tapestry as a fabric is that the tapestry weave is creating both the image and the structure simultaneously. They're completely interdependent. And so this also means that as damage starts to occur, both the structure of the fabric and the, the, the image, the design, are both affected. And you can see here very typical sorts of damage occurring here where the, the weft yarns, which are going in this direction, here you've got cream-colored silk weft yarns which have deteriorated. And again, this is a very typical type of damage that happens in a tapestry, um, probably caused by some sort of bleaching treatment that's given to the, the weft yarns. And as they break, so the, the warp yarns are exposed. And just, just to remind ourselves, really, that this same technique is used for other types of textiles, like this Chinese kazi or kosu fabric here. This is a silk fabric, very much finer in terms of its structure than the tapestry hangings that we're looking at, but made using exactly the same technique as is the Peruvian fabric here as well. So this leads to an interesting point, really. I mean, these sorts of textiles that I'm showing here tend to be conserved in much the same way as any other type of flat textile. And the trend within textile conservation over the last 20 to 30 years has been very much towards 
treatment to stabilize the structure of a textile and to prevent further damage from occurring, rather than from restoring it to its previous appearance. But one of the main points that I wanted to make today, really, is that tapestry conservation is a specialist area of textile conservation, and it has rather different concerns. I mean, it's also a different, a different fabric in terms of thickness. The, the, the woven tapestry hangings that we're talking about are very much denser and thicker than these types of textiles here. And that, of course, has an impact on the type of treatment that we might carry out. But I think that primarily it's because we think that it's important to preserve the image of the tapestry. Often the image is seen as being as important as the structure itself that really makes us decide how, how best to select a treatment to, for a, a woven tapestry. So tapestries are, are very old. They've often been hanging for a long time, sometimes even hundreds of years, and they are weak, they're fragile. Conservation nearly always entails strengthening tapestries so that they're strong enough to hang, and this usually means stitching them onto a new fabric. And a very a huge range of techniques has been used to achieve this dual aim of both stabilizing the structure and helping to restore the image. And working on the, the tapestry conservation book, which, which uh, contained contributions from a, a wide range of authors here in the United States, in the UK, and across mainland Europe, I was really struck by just how great a variety of techniques are used to just to, to carry out the, the act of stitching a tapestry onto a support fabric. I, virtually no two case studies in the book were, were carried out the same way. It was really quite fascinating. So this is really one end of the spectrum. I think this is more like the way that any other type of textile, flat textile, might be treated. In this case, this was a tapestry that had been hanging in a house with a piece of furniture in front of it, and it had rotted away behind the furniture without anybody noticing. And so there's really a very large area of tapestry missing, and it would be very difficult indeed to know what went in the missing area and to come up with some way of infilling that. So at the time that this tapestry was treated, it was deemed best to treat it as a, as a fragment and just to stitch it onto a neutral coloured wool fabric. So that's what was done. And I think you know, it's a successful treatment of this, this fragment. And I understand that, that some conservators in Germany really favour this sort of technique and are, would rather not intervene with the image at all. But a key technique that's been developed and used widely in the UK over the past 20 or 30 years has been a technique which supports and redefines the tapestry simultaneously. And this is a way of stitching a tapestry onto usually a linen sport fabric and using stitching very much that's designed to be visible, unlike in other forms of, of textile conservation where the stitching is really meant to be unobtrusive and not, is not designed to show, but actually using the support stitching as a way of helping to bring back the image. So this consists of what we call brick stitching, a stitch that goes up over one warp, down under another warp, passing through the support fabric, but the stitching is colour matched to the weft yarn that it's replacing and the, the yarn type is also chosen to be appropriate in terms of aesthetics as well as in terms of strength. This isn't the only sort of stitching that's carried out across the tapestry. There's, there's other stitching that helps to, to stabilise the, the whole structure. There's stitching that simply serves to connect the two fabrics together to attach the tapestry to the linen support fabric. And also there is stitching to rework the, the slit stitching that's part of the integral construction of the tapestry. So if that is, is missing or damaged, then that is usually restitched, and that also helps to, to hold the whole tapestry structure together. 
but this type of, of couching stitching is, is very characteristic. And this shows a very crude repair before treatment. And this area has been supported using this couching stitching. And this area actually would have been woven in silk originally, a pale colored silk representing the, the highlight on the, on the dress, on the, the fabric. You can probably see the actual stitching a bit more clearly on this example. And I think you can see how the technique here before conservation, you can see how much damage there is to the dark brown, typically, of this area around the collar, around the hat. And you can see how it has been redefined by using actually quite widely spaced stitching. So it's really designed that close to, you can see that it's stitching, you're not you don't in any way mistake it for original tapestry. But from a distance, it can be uh, surprisingly successful in really helping to pull the whole design together. And here also, this line has been put back in using stitching. It had completely gone up here. So it works very well in small areas like this, in pale colored areas. It's perhaps less successful aesthetically in large areas of dark color where it can look a bit on the spotty. It gives a rather spotty appearance, I think. And it's quite a time-consuming technique as well. But it's not always necessary to treat a tapestry in this way. This is a, a, a small tapestry which was treated recently at the Textile Conservation Center. And here, most of the tapestry was supported to a, a new linen fabric simply with an overall grid of running stitch lines. And there actually was quite a lot of, of just little areas of damage throughout the whole of this background. But the design is so busy that you don't need to put color back into it. I mean, you can see, looking at it here, from a viewing distance, you're completely unaware of those little areas of damage. So it was enough just to stabilize the structure. But there was one exception on this tapestry and that was the area of the central coat of arms. And you can see here that there were large areas of bare warps here. So this area was in need both of stabilization and of helping to redefine the image. And so, again, you can see a close-up stitching here of the, the type of, of couching stitching that was put in, and that's in this area here. Also in this lettering, which had dropped out completely. So, the more labor-intensive couching stitching was reserved for the area that was the focal point of the whole design and where you, where you would really notice it, where you would notice it if, it if it wasn't there. But other institutions use different techniques, and often you find that different techniques are used in different countries. And I think this is an, an interesting technique that's used in the DeWitt foil manufacturers in Belgium. And this workshop very much separates out the support and the redefinition of the design functions. So the tapestry is first stitched onto a dyed support fabric. So all the weak areas are supported onto new fabric. And after that, any areas that need to be visually restored are added with, with stitching in all these missing areas. And this is a, a loose needle weaving type of technique. It is anchored into the sport fabric rather than into the tapestry itself. And this is a close up of, of some of the stitching that's just securing the warp yarns to the support before the infill needle weaving takes place. And in this case, the uh, stitches are diagonal stitches, so they follow the, the spin of the yarn, the spin and the ply of the yarn. So we've already heard a lot this morning from Tina about a different type of technique and a very traditional technique used for restoring tapestries. And reweaving, as has been mentioned already, has been used for centuries to repair and restore missing areas of tapestries. And Tina has explained how it was used this morning 
on the, the tapestry, Christ is Born as Man's Redeemer. And this is another example from the Metropolitan Museum of Art where missing areas of the tapestry were rewoven. But in this case, this technique is used because in the context of this particular museum, the image is really all important. And the tapestry is, is being presented here as an example of fine art, you know, the, the image is paramount. In the case of the tapestry that we were hearing about this morning, uh, Tina did mention to me that she felt that the narrative content was felt to be so important to the tapestry that it was the legibility of the image that was really important. Different types of techniques again. I mean, this is another time-honoured technique, simply using printing or painting techniques to infill missing areas. And this is an example from a tapestry treated by Chevalier Conservation in, in Paris. And this particular tapestry, the top and bottom borders were missing and they were reinstated using completely printed infill. And this is printing pigments worked on wool, a ribbed weave wool fabric. And you know, it does, it helps to infill the image that's missing. In this case, details from the side borders and also details from borders of other similar tapestries were used to help to know what was missing. And I think that that point came across this morning. You, know, you really need to know what is missing before you can recreate it. You know, we, we really don't want to be inventing details for tapestries. We, we want to be really very clear that we know what should be there before we reinstate that detail, however we do it. But modern technology is helping us to do this. This is a tapestry which belongs to the National Trust in the UK from a house called Cotille, which is in Cornwall in the southwest of England. And as you can see here, there's a large missing area from the bottom right of the tapestry. And this is about 120 by 160 centimetres, so several feet of tapestry is missing completely. And so this would have been extremely time consuming to have infilled using a stitching technique. You know, it could have been treated like the first example, the tapestry fragment that I showed you with just a neutral fabric. But in fact, digital technology has been used extremely successfully, I think, here. And the whole of this lower right corner has been infilled with a digitally printed patch. And a second tapestry woven from this same cartoon was used to provide the detail of what was missing. So the Trust were fortunate to have another tapestry actually in their collection that, that showed this same scene. And no doubt it was time consuming to liaise with the specialist printer and to make sure that the, the new printed image was the right size and exactly the right color to fit in to this corner. But I'm sure that it was much quicker than, than a stitch technique would have been. And I think that visually it's an extremely successful solution here. But I have to say this, it works very well here because of this particular type of damage. It's often easier to create an infill where there's an area of loss in the tapestry. Very often what we're faced with are bare warps where the weft yarns have disappeared, but the warps are still there. And then that can make it rather more difficult. So an even more innovative visual restoration technique has been used recently in the UK at Hampton Court Palace, which is part of the historic royal palaces. This shows a tapestry from the History of Abraham series, which was commissioned by Henry VIII was woven with gold and silver threads and was an extremely valuable tapestry, would have been a hugely impressive sight when it was first hung at the palace. But 500 years later, the glory of these tapestries is somewhat diminished as the bright silk has faded and the metal thread has tarnished. And I'm sure that a lot of visitors hardly give the tapestries a second glance as they walk around the palace. And so this led to a really innovative research project, which has resulted in this, 
which is actually a projection of the original colours of the tapestry, which well, the, the, these colours are projected onto the front of the tapestry to give the audience some idea, some sense of what the original colours would have been like. And this is presented as a, a real show. You know, the audience's interest and enthusiasm is really cultivated. <laughs> There's a great sense of anticipation as everybody's waiting for the lights to go on. <laughs> So this is what it looks like. <laughs> and so you know, this, this early stage of this, this work may not completely recreate the tapestry's original appearance. I think we would all agree, probably. <laughs> but I think it's actually extremely successful in just making visitors look again at the tapestries. And it really helps them to appreciate the tapestry's splendor and their original appearance. <laughs> So moving on now to talk a little bit about some research into tapestry conservation, tapestry deterioration and tapestry conservation. I'm part of a research team at the University of Southampton and my colleague Dinah Eastop and I have been working for a number of years now with two colleagues from the engineering department at the university, Ms. Janice Barton and Alan Chambers. This slide shows our advisory panel for the engineering project, which is made up of representatives from bodies like the National Trust and English Heritage and Historic Royal Palaces. So we're very fortunate to have, to have such an advisory body. And we've been looking over the past number of years to see whether the sort of techniques that engineers use to monitor structures, structures like aircraft and bridges, can actually help us to monitor the condition of tapestries. So the overall aims of the project really are to see whether incipient damage could be identified before it's visible to the naked eye. Partly perhaps so that we could avoid damage happening, partly to help us inform the timing of any conservation treatments that we carry out. It might help us to decide, for example, which one of a set of tapestries is in most urgent need of conservation treatment, or it might help us to monitor tapestries over a period of time and just and see how quickly they are deteriorating. And our long-term aim is really to be able to compare the effects of different conservation treatments as well. I think that would be very valuable. I think it would be very interesting to work out just how much stitching is actually necessary to stabilize the structure of tapestries. I mean, as I've already said, that wouldn't necessarily answer the question of how much treatment is needed to help to restore the image but it might help us to separate out in our minds just how much stitching we are doing. And I think it's, it's been quite interesting, this project, because a lot of research projects in the past have focused on, on chemistry, really. We, we know quite a lot as conservators about chemical means of deterioration of textiles and other objects. We know rather less, certainly in, in textiles, about the, the physical and mechanical effects of hanging tapestries. So our current three-year project is coming to an end soon, but it, we have achieved what we set out to achieve, I think. We've been testing and then trialling two different engineering techniques. So one is digital image correlation using two digital cameras, and the other is optical fibre sensors. So we actually have optical fibres woven into this tapestry and bonded with an adhesive to the back of this tapestry. And you can't see, but here there is a, a cable connecting it to this computer here. And here we're testing out both these techniques on a little tapestry that was specially woven for us for this project. It was woven at West Dean Tapestry Studio. It was actually designed for us by two textile art students at Winchester School of Art, where the TCC was based. And I think it's a really, a really interesting little tapestry. It's made as much as possible using the techniques of historic tapestry, although it's obviously modern in design. But it was inspired by the, the colours of medieval tapestries, and notably the Angers tapestries, the apoc apocalypse tapestries in Angers. And it contains the formula, the engineering formula for stress. And you, you can't actually see here but the, it also has two words woven into it, diffuses and reflects, and those two words really 
relate to the fact that we're using optical monitoring techniques on this tapestry. We haven't yet managed to come up with a name for this tapestry. We really should do, although we do from time to time think it should just be called Stress. <laughs> I think that would be a good name for it. So our tapestry is currently being displayed at a, a children's hands-on science and technology centre in Winchester. We have got these display panels to tell the public about the monitoring that's going on. And monitoring is happening in situ periodically. So this is really part of our dissemination of science, public dissemination of science agenda as well. We're really <coughs> trying to let people know what it is that we're doing. We've also been fortunate to carry out some monitoring at Hardwick Hall, which is a property that belongs to the National Trust in England. And again, we put up some information to help disseminate to the public and to let them know more about what, what it is that we're doing. And we've found some interesting, some interesting results already from our monitoring. This graph shows a plot. This, this actually relates to the display of a little, the mo little modern tapestry at the, the TCC, which you, you saw in the first slide. And it's a plot with humidity here, on the top line, temperature, the green line, and this is strain, which is what we're measuring. It's, it's very difficult, actually, to measure stress, but what we are doing is measuring strain, which is a much easier thing to measure. And we're pretty confident that strain equals damage at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. But we have found that this is a going... Uh, the, the relative humidity is cycling over 24-hour periods, so it goes slightly down and slightly up over tw each 24-hour period. And you can see just how much the, the strain is altering in response to changes in humidity. Probably partly because as the hu relative humidity increases, the tapestry gets heavier, so it's under more strain. So we found that these were very interesting results to see just how closely the strain is, is following changes in humidity. So we're hoping that this research will give us a better understanding of how tapestries deteriorate. What we really want to know is, are tapestries being pulled apart by their own weight? You know, this is what engineers would call creep. Or is it the, the, the fatigue mechanism that's being caused by constant expansion and contraction of the yarns and the fibers with changes in relative humidity that's doing the damage? So we're, we're hoping to carry on and find out some more about this. I should just mention another research project I know that Mariah Hacker is going to talk more about this on Tuesday, so I don't want to steal her thunder at all, but I just wanted to mention that this is another major research project that has been undertaken in recent years. And this was a three-way collaboration between institutions in the UK, in Spain, and in Belgium, and it was funded by the European Union. And unlike our project, it has focused on using analytical techniques to identify chemical markers of deterioration on the whole. But it's also aiming, well, it was also aiming to gain a better understanding of the mechanisms of deterioration within a tapestry. And I think it's very exciting that the two projects are really very complementary, one that's looking more at chemical markers of deterioration and one that's looking at the physical and mechanical deterioration. And again, I won't say very much, but just to say that one of the very interesting results of this research project was to tell us that actually tapestries are much weaker than we might think. The, the unfaded backs of tapestries appear to be just as weak as the faded fronts of the tapestries, which have obviously been affected by exposure to light. And it seems that perhaps relative humidity does play a greater role in tapestry damage than we might have thought. I think we've always assumed that light damage was the over overwhelmingly important agent of deterioration. We have had a, a PhD student at, working at the Textile Conservation Centre jointly with English Heritage, Naomi Luxford, and she has been looking a little bit more at this phenomenon, and she's actually been measuring relative humidity in front of and behind tapestries on display in English Heritage properties, and she's found a very marked 
divergence in the relative humidity. It is very much damper behind a tapestry than it is in front in the open air. And so perhaps this is having a greater effect on deterioration than we had imagined. I said I was just going to touch on, on cleaning. And I put up this slide really just to say, you know, we've come a long way since this slide was taken. This is 15 or 20 years ago. There have been huge strides made in the science and the technology of tapestry cleaning. And developments have really focused on making the process gentler so that the tapestry undergoes less handling during cleaning and also in using less water so that the tapestry is less saturated during the cleaning process. But I put this slide up really just to make the point that I would really, I think this is one area where it would be really good to, to see some more research. I would really welcome some comparative research into the different, the different types of cleaning treatments that are used nowadays on tapestries and to look at their effects and their benefits. You know, how much soiling is removed, for example, how much fiber damage is there. I think it would be very good to look at that. So I've argued that tapestry conservation is, is different in many ways from other forms of textile conservation because we're focusing very much on the image. But when we're treating tapestries, we shouldn't ignore the developments that have taken place in the field of textile conservation in the past 20, 20 or 30 years. And one real change that has been happening is the developing emphasis on treating a textile or any other artifact as a source of evidence. So this may often limit the amount of treatment that a, a textile undergoes. Very often we might decide not to wet clean a textile, for example, because we are concerned that such a treatment might remove evidence perhaps of, of its construction, perhaps of past use the environments where it has been used. It's probably the case usually with tapestries that the desire to make the tapestry safe to display safely will predominate over any need to preserve evidence within the tapestry. But again, it's something that we need to think about and we need to, to make these decisions consciously. And one important area is the need to document tapestries very carefully, both before and during treatment. And the more interventive the treatment, the more important this is. The, these two images show the front and the back of a little tapestry fragment. And I think you can probably see, I hope you can see, that the, the colours on the front are really quite different from the colours on the back. For example, the, the red here has largely disappeared on the front. I think it's the red tones particularly that have changed. And so if we were giving this little tapestry fragment a treatment that's going to cover up the back with a new support fabric, probably forever, then it's really important that we capture these differences before, before the back is covered up. And tapestries can be real sources of evidence. Again, the National Trust has carried out research into, for example, the, the breeds of sheep that have been used to provide the wool that makes the yarns for medieval tapestries. And this could, could provide a lot of information. It could shed light, for example, on medieval farming practices, on trade routes, for example. And such documentation can be used in different ways. This is another interesting project currently underway in the UK. And this shows, again, West Dean Tapestry Studio, but working on a set of tapestries which are being displayed at Stirling Castle, which is a property owned by Historic Scotland. And the weaving is actually taking place in situ at Stirling Castle as a visitor attraction. And you, you may recognize the tapestries that are being woven here. And as you see here, this, these are two of the completed tapestries and they are based on the unicorn tapestries that, that um, Catherine was showing us earlier that are displayed here at the Cloisters Museum. So although the original tapestries were never at Stirling Castle, the curators there wanted to display something that was of an appropriate age and style, and so they commissioned West Dean to make a new set of tapestries. And this project is dependent on minute documentation of the original set. Although these 
tapestries are woven much more coarsely than the originals. They're, they're not replicas by any manner of means, but they are a very close representation of the original tapestries. So, coming to the end. Of, so I've tried really to give a very broad overview of tapestry conservation, but hopefully I've just said enough to show that many different techniques have been used and continue to be used to repair the structure and to restore the image of these beautiful objects. And I feel very strongly there isn't any right way or wrong way to conserve a tapestry. It depends completely on the context and on the resources available. And what's right for the Metropolitan Museum of Art may not be as appropriate in a historic house and vice versa. So new research is going to help our understanding of the mechanisms causing tapestries to decay and also our understanding of tapestry conservation treatments. While new technology is going to expand our repertoire of treatments and perhaps also allow more cost-effective and less time-intensive interventions. I was struck by something that David Howell, one of the MODHT project partners said, that because these historic tapestries are really very fragile, much weaker than we might think, then he said the most important thing is to do something. It doesn't matter what we do, we, should, we must just do something. But I think we do also need to think carefully about what, it, what is the right thing to do in each case, and not just to always unthinkingly do the same thing. I think with tapestry conservation, it can be quite difficult to evaluate our own practice. It's, it's such a long job often. If it's taken years and years to conserve a tapestry, it can be quite hard to step back and think, have we just done the right thing to this tapestry? So I think that you know, the meta really to be applauded in, in convening this symposium to, to think about these issues this week. But I think that we do need to spend some time evaluating our practice. It's the only way that we're going to, to take things forward in the practice of tapestry conservation. And I think that even if we're using techniques that support the structure and restore the image simultaneously, I think it would be good for us to separate out in our minds which functions are being performed so that we, we've got a better sense, a clearer idea of what we're doing to support the to stabilise the structure of the tapestry and what it is that we're doing to enhance the design. And maybe if we think about them as, as two separate operations, even if we carry them out simultaneously, it will help us to make decisions about treatments. So I would just like to thank all of those who, all my colleagues who have very generously provided images for me to use in my talk this afternoon. It's all of these all of the institutions mentioned here. And I just finished with putting up my email address in case anybody is, would like to contact me afterwards. And also, I'm afraid, an advert for our new publication. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.